Hi, my name is Gila, and today I'm going to be talking about the study that I conducted for my dissertation in sociological criminology called Victims Are Doing It For Themselves, Examining the Move from Victim to Advocate. Between 2014 and 2016, I noticed a focus on sexual violence in media, culture, and politics in both Canada, where I'm from, and the United States. Obviously, sexual violence has been in these spaces many times before, but the difference that I noticed was the reaction to victims who were coming forward with their stories about victimization. I found that victims were being supported publicly, while perhaps not the same results were happening in the criminal justice system. And I noticed that when victims were being talked about, about the stories that they were sharing, they were being called advocates and activists in a way that didn't capture their victimization and survivorship, in a way that made it sound that becoming an advocate and activist is something that is easy when we know that that is not the case. And so my research question was, how do victims and survivors of sexual violence become anti-sexual violence advocates and activists? I wanted to understand the narratives that they can tell us, the stories, about their process, experiences, motivations, and identities that can help us understand the path that they went on. And I looked at three theories in order to do this. The first is labeling theory, which talks about how people become deviants or offenders. And what labeling, process, what labeling theory tells us is that the process involves an act of primary deviance, so the first act of offending, the application of labels by society, we call them a deviant person or an offender, then they, can they commit further acts of deviance, secondary deviance, because of the social rejection through the labels that has happened to them. They internalize this identity that I am now a deviant person, and they form their, their identity around that. And then they join the deviant subculture. They join other like-minded and like-acted deviants like themselves. Feminist standpoint theory says that a similar process helps, happens when we label people victims. So a primary victimization occurs, they then may disclose the victimization to someone and the victim label is applied to them as well as sometimes some other negative labels that we do through some of the rape myths that we tell or the myths that we tell about sexual abuse of children and others. Then this can lead to sec secondary victimization, which is the um, negative um, responses to the disclosures and a feeling that they are being socially reject rejected. They internalize the stigmatizing label of victim and other negative labels that have been applied to them, and this may alter the victim and survivor status. But what I wanted to understand was where is the ability to overcome stigma here? Where is the ability to reject the label? That has to be included if somebody goes on to become advocate and activist, and that's something that I wanted to understand. And so I found that the labeling process was actually extended by John Cassis in 1980, where he talked about tertiary deviance. Tertiary deviance is when a deviant confronts, assesses, and rejects the negative identity that is embedded in secondary deviation, and they transform that identity into something positive. So when those who have been shamed, silenced, or marginalized demand recognition and rights. And so I applied that to the victimization cycle. We know that there's primary victimization and secondary victimization, but maybe there's something about tertiary victimization where an individual becomes an advocate or activist. And feminist standpoint theory adds to that by saying listening to the victim's voices can reveal how they resist, re reject, and overcome labels and stigma. Labels, in fact, can hide the resistance. And so I wanted to move away from the label and understand how they went on to become an advocate and an activist. Feminist standpoint theory, unlike labeling theory, also um, looks at intersectional identities and how that impacts both victimization and resistance. So I looked at the literature review, I looked at the literature on tertiary deviance, on survivor advocates and activists that had nothing to do with sexual violence, as well as the literature on victims of sexual violence and their advocacy and activism. And what I did was I, I, using a narrative feminist research methodology, I conducted 25 semi-structured interviews with participants from both the mainstream population and religious groups. As an Orthodox uh, Jewish woman, I was interested to look at this um, question from a religious lens, as well as continue um, looking at uh, criminology through a religious lens as I had done on a previous study on a murder in the Orthodox Jewish community. And to participate in this study, one had to be a victim or survivor of sexual violence, 
They had to have disclosed to someone other than a mental health professional, and they had to be or have been involved in anti-sexual violence advocacy or activism. And so I asked them to tell me three stories. What are their experiences of victimization? What were their experiencing experiences with disclosures and the aftermath of those disclosures? And how did they become an advocate and activist? What was their process that led them into this um, advocacy and activism? And I, I then analyzed both the individual narratives of each person I interviewed, as well as comparing all 25 um, narratives to each other to find the common themes. And just some quick socio-demographic characteristics and data about my participants. The majority were female, white, and living in the United States. They ranged in age from 22 to 70 years old, and 32% of the participants' victimizations occurred at the hands of a religious figure, and 76% of my participants had disclosed publicly. And what I found when I analyzed my data was that there were five advocacy and activism themes and initial pathways. So that means that um, these five themes were the main ones in which they engaged in advocacy and activism at the outset, as well as every single participant had a number of these themes. Nobody had only one theme or one pathway in their process of becoming an advocate. However, they had a combination. And I'm going to explain what each one means. So the disclosure response theme means that something about their disclosure itself or the response to their disclosure made them become an advocate. Or learned advocacy was where they learned about advocacy efforts or an advocate took them under their wing and they became an advocate through that. Another theme was the victimization theme where something about the victimization or the aftermath of the victimization led them to become an advocate. Empathic response is where survivors and victims found out that there were other victims of their perpetrator that led them to become an advocate or they read stories about other victims that had nothing to do with their own perpetrators that led them to become an advocate. And then finally, systems experiences were survivors positive or negative experiences with different systems like journalism, the medical system, the criminal justice system led them to become an advocate. And we're going to look at some quotes here describing each one. In the disclosure response pathway, one woman spoke about disclosing allowed her to create a language in the Muslim community and the South Asian community about victimization that led her to become an advocate. For another, when the bishop put outed him to a journalist and he was so mean spirited, this is what led him to become an activist. Another chose to focus on religion as his, as his advocacy because he was abused by both priests and nuns and felt that religion is such a powerful grooming tool. Um, a positive experience that a woman had at a, at a domestic violence shelter and a transitional housing program after being abused by a priest in her church led her to become an advocate working there. Um, empathic response, one woman said that when I heard the words coming out of a victim story that I was reading, I was so moved because I felt like that could be coming out of my own mouth. I felt like I had to share my own story. And learn advocacy is where one man said, there was nothing for male survivors. So I took it upon myself. When I was invited by a speaker to be a male speaker at a local television station, there were hundreds of thousands of people watching. And so he learned how to become an advocacy through going along with this other speaker um, who encouraged his speaking engagement. And so then what I did was I layered my findings about the five, five pathways into the labeling process that, that we have spoken about previously. And what I first found was that sexual violence committed, committed against women by men, specifically men who are more likely acquaintances and strangers, and repeat victimization is common. So what I found in my data was very common to what we find across the literature when it comes to sexual violence. In addition, there were a range of long lasting negative ramifications um, ranging from alcoholism all the way until suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. And so looking at the first pathway, the victimization and aftermath theme, and uh, uh, that, that um, layers onto primary victimization. 72% of the participants became advocates after experiencing sexual violence because they felt they had a responsibility to advocate. This was true even for those who were advocates in other areas prior to becoming an anti-sexual violence advocate because they felt that the other things that they did were just nice projects that they were involved in. 
But after experiencing sexual violence, they had a responsibility to do something to help others that may have been um, in similar situation to themselves. In addition, I found that the first thing they had to do before disclosing to someone else was to disclose it to themselves, to acknowledge and name what happened to themselves. There was a hierarchy of victimization experiences for those who had repeat victimization where they could tell me, Gila, number two experiences was the one that set me off on my advocacy path for, versus the first experience or the third experience. They were driven, they felt empowered to be advocates, but they were also ang angry and they, one of them um, called it righteous anger, which was led, what, what led him to become an advocate and an activist. For secondary victimization, there were three themes under this, under this um, part of the cycle, and these were about resisting stigma. So for those who fell under the disclosure response theme, disclosures both led to advocacy, but disclosures themselves were advocacy on its own, and they were a way to resist stigma. I'm going to tell my story, and I'm not going to let you put any shame on me, was what many of them said. They talked about coming out of the closet as victims and survivors, and they talked about assessing various fears. Um, do I tell this person? Is it the right person? Will my community kick me out? Will my family look at me differently? Will I lose my job if my name is in the media? But they also discussed some difficulties that they had after disclosing. 64% of my participants were stigmatized after they disclosed. Women discussed being blamed. Men discussed difficulty in finding help post-disclosure. And religious and LGBTQ victims talked about the difficulty in managing the stigma in their own communities. However, what many of them spoke about was something that they never anticipated, was that there was a benefit to disclosing. They were able to accept themselves, they supported themselves and others, they felt integration that they didn't have to hide this um, shameful, what they felt was shameful or secret thing that had happened to them. Secondary victimization and stigma resistance also applies to our third theme, the empathic response theme. Learning about other people's experiences with their own perpetrator or others situated what happened to them in the broader problem of sexual violence and other victims. This didn't just happen to me, they said, but there's a whole world out there of victims and survivors who suffered as well. Some of them reported their perpetrators or volunteered with advocates. They disclosed what happened to them for the first time and they connected with other victims. Others stood up for the, for the people they were reading about or learning about or for other victims. And they also stood up through themselves through storytelling and releasing shame. Some of them spoke about righting wrongs. They said, I can't believe my perpetrator abused others because of my silence. So now I'm gonna speak up so that they'll never be able to hurt anyone else. The fourth theme, the systems experience theme was about positive and negative experiences with different systems leading my participants to become advocates and activists. And this was where they were able to decenter the systems to address, injustice, address injustices and the secondary victimization that had previously been applied to them, and sometimes even work in these systems themselves. They, advocating, they advocated and rejected some of the way that systems treated um, victims, and they also owned their own narrative in, by working with, with or against these systems. Those that worked in systems found peer support. However, they were silent about their own survivor identity. So while supporting other victims, they weren't able to also say, I too am a victim. They were seen only as the advocate or activist. And then finally, our fifth theme about learned advocacy layers on the labeling cycle of tertiary victimization. So this is where they learned about sexual violence and they learned about advocacy and activism efforts. Um, in this one, it was very clear that the primary and secondary victimization experiences led them to become an advocate and to, to do some building in their own community. Interestingly, um, more participants found support amongst fellow advocates than participants who found support amongst peer victim groups. There were benefits to being um, advocates, to becoming advocates, but there were also challenges around boundary setting, burnout, being triggered when helping other people, as well as being legitimized by other advocates um, around power. In addition, as I said before, some survivors had to keep their survivor status hidden or felt that it was better for them to keep their survivor status hidden. And I was very moved by one participant who called herself a survivor in the dark in her advocacy work. I also asked my participants which labels they preferred. More participants preferred the survivor label 
and more participants preferred the advocate label versus the activist label. Many said that they didn't ever consider themselves advocates and activists until they saw the call for my study. But they also acknowledge that there is no word for survivors who become advocates that capture their multiple identities, and that the word thriver is not necessarily one that feels that they go that goes far enough. All my participants are examples of survivor advocates, but they may not all be classified as tertiary victims which does not take away from the wonderful work they're doing to advocate and, and be an activist on behalf of other survivors. So in conclusion, understanding the why and the when are important to understanding the how of victims be, go on to become advocates themselves. The five themes are evidence of agency and stigma resistance. The message that victims will not be supported if they come forward silences them. And just as disclosure begets disclosure, advocacy also begets advocacy but we have to give victims and survivors the opportunity to lead and recognize that advocates need support to sustain themselves and their work. There are many ideas for further research for anybody who's interested in contacting me later. I've also included the sources and please reach out if you'd like more information on those sources. Thank you so much for listening and thank you for this Faith and Flourishing Conference.